Well, hello everybody and welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's call. We're so happy you're here. This is Stephanie Hall with the ESRD NCC and I'll be your host for today's event. Um, just a few reminders before we get started with today's presentation. Do a remind everybody that this call is being recorded and will be posted on the NCC website, usually within about three business days. Um, all the lines are muted upon entry into this event, but we do want to hear from you. So please submit any questions or comments uh, via the chat box during the presentation today. And at the conclusion, our goal is to answer as many questions as the time allows. Also, this event is approved for one CEU. At the end of the presentation, we ask that you stay connected to your computer and a post survey will appear, giving you the opportunity to share your feedback. After hitting the submit button, another screen will appear. I'll take you to our learning management center where you'll be able to get a CEU. Um, next slide, Matt. It's a little bit about the agenda today and um, it's Dr. Morphin, um, which uh, I'll be doing his introduction in just a moment. Uh, the topic today will be unplanned dialysis start, a home first centered approach patient-centered approach. Again, uh, please submit any questions that you have for Dr. Morphin uh, throughout the presentation and we will get to those at the end. Um, Dr. Morphin is a professor of medicine at UC Davis and is the medical director of home dialysis at Satellite in Sacramento, California. Dr. Morphin launched his first home program in 2009. In 2017, he launched Optimal Transitions a transitional dialysis program providing dialysis patients the time, support, and resources to select the right dialysis therapy for them. He has been a patient advocate throughout his career and has successfully been able to transition many patients to a home dialysis modality. He is a frequently invited speaker across, across the country to share on these experiences. So we're pleased to have Dr. Morphin here today. And Dr. Morphin, I'll turn it on over to you. Great, thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, warm introduction, and uh, thank you all for joining this um, webinar. Um, I uh, hopefully there won't there won't, be, won't be too many background noises um, as I'm in the clinic. But I uh, the title of the talk is "Unplanned Dialysis Start: A Home First Patient Centered Approach." Uh, next slide. Uh, and the objective of uh, this afternoon's talk is to overview the unplanned dialysis starts and outcomes, a patient-centered and home-first approach, detail the path from the hospital to home dialysis. And I will say that we've been at this for a better part of a decade. Um, you know, my colleagues and, and I'm at UC Davis uh, here in Sacramento, California, our clinical nurse specialist, Maureen Craig, who won't be part of this talk, has really influenced and had a lot of input and a lot of her um, you know, great work that she does I will be uh, implementing this talk and I will um, talk a little bit of how we work as a team to assure that patients are really delivering the best optimal, uh, best fit, if you will, for their uh, dialysis given, you know, the high burden of the disease and the many times patients are coming to the, to the hospital, uh, unfortunately, to, to initiate dialysis. We're going to describe some of the barriers to that path to home dialysis, specifically for those patients who are really coming in um, very um, urgently coming into the hospital and how we can best um, perhaps mitigate some of the fears and some of their concerns and really provide hope for them. And then we'll review some outcomes here at UC Davis and, and opportunities that we felt that has been very successful in, in really promoting this path. Next slide, please. And so just, I will start with the patient here. I use the, the word crash dialysis start, um, just to typify in terms of really unplanned start. 66, a 60 year old Latino male, type 2 diabetes. This is a patient right now that in many hospitals we see, um, you know, sort of middle aged patient who's had diabetes, leading cause of kidney disease in this country. You see the labs are abnormal. The patient hadn't seen a doctor for several months, had some fatigue, and then ultimately had, um, was sent to the ER from the primary care doctor. In the emergency room, they did some levels. There was no emergency for dialysis, but we sort of know sort of the cadence of this patient and what happens to this patient and what the next steps are. And this is really where we're trying to find interventions and trying to find out with ways that we could basically be able to navigate this patient from a crash start or from an unplanned start to a more optimal start, knowing that this patient is really in this sort of period of, of understanding and learning more about this disease. Diabetes is something this patient's had, but 
I think had because of the um, the inconsistency and, and the lack of follow up and perhaps lacks of access to hair. Many factors we know are, are challenges for for continuity of care and, and for really uh, management. I really I think there's a lot of um, opportunity to, to, for these patients. Next slide, please. And then uh, this is a little bit of my financial disclosure. I said earlier about my optimal trust medical directorship. Also on the next page, uh, medical advisory board speaker and bureau. Next slide, please. And so I think that it's good to think about the backdrop. I think many on this call understand the uh, current climate of our end-stage skin disease programs. You know, most patients are in-center. I would say almost all of them, if you want to use the percentage of that, close to 90%. And, um, and we really have tried to make an effort and put a dent on this, and it's been very challenging. Next slide. Um, uh, next slide. Yeah. And so we know that uh, there's a discordance between what and there's other survey data which i don't have the slide here but other survey data have shown that there is significant amount of professionals or nurses renal professionals that are in the industry of taking the care of our patients that they would choose to do a home dialysis and if you take a step further this survey data here uh, multiple um, references here from um, from the early 2000s that the majority of the renal professionals also feel when they sort of think of patients that the percentages are 30 to 40 to 50 percent in any given survey that we feel that there is some um, opportunity for patients to do self-care and therefore potentially be a home patient but yet there's a disconnect between you know there's a surveys from the early 2000s and, and what we're able to do in terms of home dialysis uptake home dialysis obviously is peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis but i think that that really is an, an unmet need where we have sort of a, a perception that patients are able to do this but then perhaps we aren't able to utilize and have very low utilization of these services. Next slide. And this, this really uh, falls in the heels of, of the executive order that was signed in July of 2019, pre-pandemic, where really HHS laid out three goals for improving kidney health. And many of you may be familiar with this and really why it's really changed on how much of the resources are gonna be allocated and how we really approach. And so programs, and, and strategies to do a home first approach like we've been doing here at UC Davis, I think resonates with some folks and also outside the hospital when patients are in their clinics to really continue to um, promote home dialysis. And here is sort of the three goal, the goals that have been outlined, reduce the number of Americans developing end-stage kidney disease by 25%, uh, by 25% by 2030. And I think this is another big lofty goal. 80% of the new end-stage kidney disease patients receive either a home dialysis therapy or receiving a kidney transplant. And I think for many of us who've been doing this for many, I just showed you data, we were on 12, 15%, maybe at best in some markets, 25%. It's, it, it's really a tall task, but I think we have to say, we gotta set the bar high if we're gonna be able to make some meaningful um, gains uh, in this area. And then double the number of kidney transplants by 2030. So I think all kind of approaching all fronts, many, uh, many um, health care systems and many dialysis providers are now starting to think upstream, upstream and reducing the incidence of NCH kidney disease or delaying the onset of NCH kidney disease, do more preemptive kidney transplants, and deliver more home dialysis. And I think we obviously have to do things differently. The way we are, the strategy of waiting for patients to come into the hospital and then be able to, and then sending them to a center Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, without really any meaningful engagement to really understand what are the barriers or challenges for that patient who came from home and has to go in the hospital or has to go into a clinic. What are the challenges for the patient for them to be successfully to be a home patient? I think that those are the kind of conversations that need to be had to really further individualize the care for each individual patient. Next slide, please. So I think this to kind of, to, to highlight that point, this is actually a, a study, it's called the Stark study out of Canada. Um, and this is just an overview of the, the study. Essentially, there was three centers in Toronto, there was three programs that used multidisciplinary. So they actually had a very well-staffed multidisciplinary team where they had a patient's that were being followed in a health system, right? So there was sort of, a, obviously Canada has a different healthcare system we do, but in this study, they had patients that were quote unquote in the system, if you will. And so the, the way they define optimal starts is starting a patient on dialysis with a fistula or a PD catheter. And you can see here, they had four and 36 patients that they studied. Remember these patients were very well plugged in. They had a dietitian, they had a social worker, they had really good pre-dialysis care. 
But even despite that, there was still a significant amount, 56% or so of these patients that had suboptimal starts. And many of the reasons that were quoted that were optimal starts, and I will show another slide earlier of, of our experience at UC Davis, was really similarly with saying patients, it's usually a patient-related factor where the patient, patient perhaps wasn't ready to start. There was also a maybe delayed onset in terms of when the nephrologist was seeing the patient. And I think the other one that is hard to wrap around is this sort of sudden onset of kidney failure or AKI, that it's basically a patient that maybe is in your clinic, but then all of a sudden has an event where the patient maybe is not the one who's progressing at a certain percentage of decline per month that you can almost predict when they may need to get the dialysis. These are the patients who have a sudden onset who are in your health system. So I think that we have to have sort of quote unquote safety net programs to assure these patients can kind of get re um, you know stabilized and then reintroduced into these um, kidney modality discussions. Next slide. And so if you look at leg acceleration, this is actually from our center at UC Davis, where we looked from 2010 to 2012. Again, looking at here at 107 clinic patients. Again, patients in our clinics that were seen, you know, quarterly to every um, six months, depending on their level of GFR. And you can see here that we had 70% of these patients started with a tunnel dialysis catheter. And, a, and we found the association in the modeling model is that the TDC tunnel dialysis catheter, the, again, suboptimal start of dialysis was due to failure to attend a pre-dialysis education class. Again, again, going back to patient-related factors, and we'll talk a little bit about what those factors may be, even for patients who are in the outpatient, but certainly patients who have to be in the hospital. And then the other piece that I mentioned in the prior study was this late acceleration of EGFR, so really the, this late deceleration is probably a better way of putting it, where there's this sudden onset of kidney um, deceleration where this is unpredictable and the patient basically goes from a GFR of 30 to GFR of 5 from you know, pneumonia, heart failure, uh, cardiac catheterization, a number of reasons, especially when we're dealing with very vulnerable patient populations that we deal with. Next slide. So for that reason, if we look a little bit more carefully, we look at when our patients at UC Davis and our health uh, system, when patients start, you can see here that you look from 2016 to 2017 in the blue, our in-center starts in the in the orange are outpatient start. And I will say that we don't start, there was a time, you know, before my time, you know, over 20 years or so, where patients all started dialysis in the hospital. It was like, well, patients are remake, let's watch the patients monitor it. Now we have ways to get patients started from the clinic. And that's sort of what we try to do, get patients started from the clinic, hopefully to a home program, a PD catheter. But even if they have to go in the clinic, they at least have a fistula. And again, getting back to my point earlier is that you are, even despite you know, our best efforts to assure patients have optimal starts, it's really the patients that perhaps aren't on our radar that have kind of this sudden onset. And those are the patients that I'd like to talk about in this presentation when we look at these percentages that are above 70, 75% um, that we need to uh, really address. Again, looking at, at kind of a safety net approach for these patients who have to all now have to really make some life-changing decisions on their next, you know, their next phase of their care. Next slide. And so here's some quotes. Um, this is sort of the, the great John Wooden out of uh, the Wizard of uh, Westwood, as uh, any of you who are UCLA or, or college basketball fans, I should say, you know, fail the plan is a plan to fail. I think that's an appropriate comment. That's what I tell patients. I said, when we're sitting in our CKD clinic and we have to think about planning, we want to sort of, as they say, we want to hope for the best plan for the worst case scenario, and we need to have a plan. And however, as I said, it's the great Mike Tyson, the puncher from the uh, boxing. I'm sure you've all heard of Mike Tyson, sort of um, a knockout artist, if you will, from the uh, 90s or so, a very um, colorful figure, if you will. You know, uh, Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I think that that sort of uh, resonates the plan is that you may have a plan, but then when you hit the when you hit the wall, what happens? And we're all humans. We're not sort of vegetables. We sort of sense we have uh, family commitments. We, you know, we have trials and tribulations, especially right now with the pandemic and many of us who've lost uh, dear ones to this terrible pandemic. I think that we sort of now are, are, are a lot of the um, early discussion that can have around CKD, for example, we really make an effort to educate our patients about CKD sometimes falls to the wayside when all of a sudden you're actually faced with the decision of today of starting dialysis. Next slide. Um, and so 
we'll we'll sort of go back to the first patient. We'll call him Roberto. Again, he was sort of the intro patient that had the hypertension, Spanish speaking only. He again feeling poorly. Um, no recent healthcare, but as I said, he was known diabetic and now he needs dialysis. So how do we take this patient? And I always like to tell our, our staff and I think our learners and I think even our colleagues about talking about what we don't do enough um, is take social history. I think we are very good at diagnosing, we're very good at treating, but I think when we start getting into the, the weeds, if you will, of trying to find optimal therapies in our patients, we need to take a social history. Um, and we need to take a social period to really understand what are the patient's cultural attitudes, what's the patient's, uh, what are, what's their insight on this disease? You know, some may have, some may not, but some of them may have friends who've been on dialysis or who've got a kidney transplant. So I think when we have, were approaching this patient, this patient spoke Spanish only. Next slide. And so when we're sort of thinking about Spanish speaking, we're thinking about any individual, we sort of have sort of as a as, as an obligation, as as the quality, one of the pillars of quality of care is a patient-centered approach, and 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 the um, the, the backbone of that is shared decision making that oftentimes we don't do enough of, and as defined in the oncology literature, which I think should be applied to sort of every aspect of care, not just oncology, is that you have a life-threatening disease where several treatment options are open, and I think this is no different. We know our patients who have kidney disease. They have a mortality that is that is there with colon cancer at stage five. I think you have a better outcome in five years if you had metastatic colon cancer than you have end stage kidney disease. We know that mortality is five year survivals, you know, 40% or so at five years. So we know we have a really high level of burden of disease. And although we don't have the best data in terms of head to head comparison of PD versus HHD versus PHD. Some observational data and registry evaluations, and one of us who do this on a day to day, I think that they can make a compelling case that patients who do dialysis at home, patients where they could retain the residual kidney function, uh, therapies that potentially can improve their blood pressure, therapies that could have better management of their volume, because we know volume is probably the most important metric in our dialysis patient population. You can make a compelling case that the outcomes will certainly be different. Um, across the board. And again, the idea here is that many patients aren't being presented with even that on this. So if it's not on the menu, how do you actually choose it? I think that's really the point. And, if, and I think that the more we have, we have these avenues and accesses for our hospitals, for our clinic teams to operationalize these modalities uh, from the hospital, or from your clinic, I think obviously we have an obligation to treat it. It's actually one of the indications for um, coverage by CMS is modality education to inform patients, inform consent that the patients have an option other than doing dialysis in the center. Next slide. And so I think do patients feel informed? Again, this is survey data um, that is done, it's compiled here, and I have a reference down below um, that basically was uh, surveying patients and, and they asked them some simple questions about did they feel, you know, very the domains of the aspects of kidney care and such as conditions that led to kidney failure, 52% said yes. I think the things that really stick out here are if you go down to, um, you know, what are the benefits and burdens associated with each type of dialysis, the minority of the patients actually felt comfortable or felt informed, you know, less than a third. And then doctors ask your values of preferences of those options. Well, again, like I said earlier, if you're not given the options, then how are you going to prefer? How are you going to decide where are your values are at? Where how you form a how do you form a, an idea about a modality A, B, and C? And again, 20%. So one out of five patients said that they had been informed. And then again, in daily life. And then the other one that sticks out here is the is third of the bottom is not starting dialysis could be an option. Two percent. And I think that's also part of the equation. You know, you want to talk dialysis at home, dialysis in the center. You talk about the uh, transplantation and you talk about not doing dialysis. And again, for some, going back to individualizing care and really uh, taking the autonomy of the patient and the family, I mean, this may be a pertinent conversation, but again, I think this is areas that these are, th this really gives you a glimpse of where patients are uh, in, in, in this decision-making when they're, when they're provided, um, when they're being evaluated. Next slide. So, um, this is sort of an important opportunity to sort of really, and this is a source out of Maureen Craig, as I mentioned in the outset, she's been fantastic and does a lot of our education and really inspir inspiration, if you will, for all of us to really uh, think about 
you know, how do we, how should we approach a patient who is really uh, closed off, who is now really afraid and really thinking about, okay, you know, patient shows up, the doctor sends them to the ER, blood tests don't look emergent, but we need to start dialysis and you have one or two choices, you either live or you die. I mean, there really isn't much room for error. There isn't much room for conversation. So we really want to spin the conversation about what is it about you were doing what you know let, let's let's get to know about your life what was your life about going back to taking that sort of quote-unquote heads assessment we used to we teach our medical students how to take a really good social history in the first couple of years you know you know the content their knowledge levels are are, are skyrocketing so they i think anybody any anybody who's sort of a, a person who's a relate who's in a relationship who's a friend who's a father who's a, a wife etc who's a partner could can really understand that these are really sort of very practical conversations and really understanding what brings joy is really an important branch point to understand what the motivation is. And again, we know that there's a high incidence of depression in our patients. So I think it is good to sort of um, talk about sort of, you know, what are some, some of the goals, if you will, you know, you're kind of down, you've hit rock bottom, if you will, if you want to use that expression. And so next slide. So I think that this really requires um, really a lot of engagement. I think because we were talking about a therapy that is now done at home that is on uh, self-care versus a full assist therapy in the center, you have to take someone like Roberto, for example, who after discussing it with him and his family, he lived in a ranch, he had a, a really big, you know, family, extended family, had multiple generation household. And he, um, after discussion and really understanding that he wanted to work again, he wanted to work, he wanted autonomy, he wanted to have that level of time and also understanding some of the uh, benefits that he decided to do home hemodialysis. And this is a quote, this was all has brought my family even closer. I'm grateful to be a finally doctor. And he actually did home hemodialysis for about five years before his kidney transplant. It's sort of a nice corollary is his daughter's and then he had a daughter-in-law. He had like multiple care partners. One of his uh, his daughter actually ended up becoming a a, a, a PCT or a patient-centered a technician in a, one of the dialysis and center units. Again, got so competent and really assisting his dad. So I think it's really one of those uh, really inspiring. I, I think these these stories, which are not case reports, these are not just one-offs. These are real stories, and some of you are on this call could probably resonate with some of these great stories you've had uh, with your own uh, transformations in some of our patients. And again, in some of the most vulnerable patients coming to the hospital. Next slide. And so if we kind of go a little bit, kind of, uh, we take a second patient, we'll use the name Hong, 60 year old Vietnamese um, a nun who's just arrived in the United States. She's Vietnamese speaking only, small, um, frail, needs dialysis now, has a really a more distant, has this, the cultural, um, have to be aware of, of the cultural um, and customs. She defers everything to her sister, um, but it was clearly a help. Um, we're so worried, you know, as like, as you should be, you know, when we have someone who is, um, has sort of these later stages of kidney disease and it is needing to uh, get on kidney replacement therapy. Next slide. And so it's really fear um, and, uh, regardless of, of, of how folks are um, communicating or, or interpreting fear, it, it, it is fear nonetheless in terms of their, 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 where they're at. And I think we all would feel the same way, but the fear could be an opportunity for change. Next slide. And, you know, what is fear? I'll use the uh, famous uh, rap artist or pop artist Pitbull here. Uh, when it comes to fear, you got to forget everything and run or you could face everything and rise and uh and i think this really to me resonates a bit and says that yes i think that you have to sort of think about a patient who is afraid who is paralyzed by the fear of the unknown and then it, it is a um, part of the team and the family to really educate and to really be there to to provide hope because the you know if you have fear as being a, a monumental task it's kryptonite is hope um, next slide. And so if we actually think about that, and, and this patient had a great story, is that after really full engagement and discussions, and we and I'll share a, bit, a little bit about what we do in terms of an algorithm and how we, um, you, know, you know, we're at, uh, at UC Davis and we have many different, you know, I always tell our uh, uh, 
uh, recruits in terms of the three languages spoke outside of English in our hospital. You know, we have uh, Spanish, uh, Hmong, uh, which is a, a Thai dialect, and then the third is Russian. And we have over 45 uh, different uh, languages that are predominantly um, that, that are spoken in our hospital. So we have to have a very um, robust interpreting services and really learn a little bit more about the cultural norms as we we're, we're talking about a therapy that is uh, going to re require full participation. And in this case, uh, the you know the, this was a quote from Hong. My family and myself are truly grateful for everything you've done. And she ended up going on peritoneal dialysis and was quite successful with that. Next slide. And, and so, um, and we know that from what we do is we uh, survey every patient that comes to the hospital, um, gets evaluated more for we actually rule home out, not rule it in. You know, so I think when we use the evaluation, we really use obviously use an evaluation tool to see if the patient it has the um, the characteristics that will make them successful to be home. And the big one there is the motivation, as I stated earlier. But I think we sort of noticed that even after doing this, you could see the uptick and some of the techniques which I'll share with you towards the end of this presentation have been very successful that Maureen and, and our colleagues have been able to implement. You could see, you know, most of our patients wanted to home dialysis, you know, three quarters of it. Next slide. And yet, if you look at the uh, starts, we have that high interest in home dialysis, but yet we continue to see a disconnect because we're we're still getting 30%. I think it's still pretty good to go into a home and transitional care program, which we'll talk about what that is. Um, but you see that we still have some room, and a lot of it is the resources that we have patients that could that want to do home, and maybe that's sort of you know not right now, or we don't have. Oftentimes we we have a disconnect in, in in training, and maybe the training they're in transition. You know they're transitioning into the hospital, maybe they're transitioning home as well. And so we really want to set the stage, if you will, for someone to follow up, to have that ongoing conversation about home. And I think those are the other uh, mechanisms and, and pathways that need to be developed for these patients, because maybe they have to go in the center, they left the hospital, they'd like to go home, but as they go home, our experience has been the patient, oftentimes there's really the handoffs, those sort of quote unquote warm handoffs, are some areas that I think we need to improve on. Next slide. And here are some of the, you know, what are the barriers of starting dialysis? Again, you're seeing the percentages, you're seeing and getting, trying to understand a little bit more how we can kind of close this gap. But if you have this degree of uptake, you'd say, wow, we're, that's a, if you're saying 75% of the patients want to do home dialysis, how many can we, you know, if we can even approach that number, even if we get it to 50%, we would start moving closer to those lofty goals of the executive order. Next slide. And here are some of the barriers uh, that um, challenges in terms of starting home dialysis. We know we need to have significant amount of provider education on how to prescribe. You know, if, if, if you don't know how to prescribe the therapy, how are you going to promote it? So I know there's a lot of information, a lot of um, uh, webinars and, and a lot of training uh, with our not only our fellows but our, our, our workforce uh, that are prescribing therapy to really not only educate them about the prescription but also understand about sort of you know there isn't one size fits all there isn't quote unquote the ideal PD patient the ideal home hemo patient I think bias is introduced significantly so I think the more the programs uh, have an uptake of home I think we realize that you know there is a, a many different shades of types of patients that do home, uh, home dialysis, just like the patients who do in center. And, and then nothing, we, we need to sort of really try to uh, understand where our blind spots are. And then the acute kidney injury, again, is, is one that where we're faced, you know, at the moment to start dialysis. And, and that's something where I stated that we, we, we could certainly mobilize and, and educate and find ways to get patients either at urgent start in the hospital with urgent start PD programs that are sort of um, becoming um, more prevalent in many of the hospitals or handing those patients over to urgent start programs in the outpatient setting. And then substance abuse, again, if you have folks who are obviously using substances, they're going to be challenging the frailty with no care partners. Again, there are some opportunities there perhaps to consider some in-home support services. And then there is another challenge for patients who perhaps would be great, who maybe have a, a goal to go home, but they have to go in a short-term rehab center because of their illness. Next slide. 
Uh, so going home, the UC Davis experience, next slide, um, just to share a little bit about sort of the modality. This is sort of over a span of over 10 years. This sort of gives a, a number um, of where we're at as, 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 uh, as a health system. And again, we're at 15.5% and we sort of plateaued here and pretty much a little bit more on the PD side than HHT side. But we feel like a lot of this movement has really been by a lot of the aggressive education we've had in identification of patients. I think there still needs to be a few more um, areas, as I stated earlier, these handoffs, these programs on the outside that could help follow up with this sort of, I'll use the words, home signal. Patients who perhaps signal to be home, but they want to do maybe short-term in-center. There is the lack of follow-through, I think, is an area that we need to work on. Next slide. Um, and so this is kind of a, a, a schematic on how we think about connecting patients to their lives. Again, this is a, a nice quote that uh, Maureen sort of came up with, connect patients back to their lives. And I, I think that really is what we're trying to do. You know, as the, as the great Belden Scribner said, you know, I call it the, the, they call it the Belden Scribner rule. You know, I, I, the, the purpose of dialysis is to rehabilitate the patient. And so if we're not rehabilitating the patient, then why are we doing dialysis? That's the whole the whole point is that we really want to do a therapy that's, yes, get them out of harm's way, but we want patients to live. We don't want patients just to live to go to a dialysis, to, and dialysis becomes their only thing they live for. We want dialysis to be a vehicle, a bridge, if you will, to hopefully transplantation, but also for opportunities to sort of live life, have that extension, and to do the things that they like to do, like getting back to that goal setting. And the patient here, the different types of patients we evaluate, these new onset like Roberto CK5, in-center patients who come in, you know, that, that maybe are um, failing in-center, if you want to use that word, who failed kidney transplants or even who have failed in other home modality. We evaluate them with the, we call them the home action team, which is comprised of the consulting service, myself and Maureen and a few others that basically we review our outcomes uh, on a quarterly basis, we evaluate them for medical and all the psychological evaluation and feasibility. We really want to see if the patient going to be receptive as a, a care partner. Not to say you need a care partner, but we at least want to create that sort of support system. And then there's this mindfulness and wellness promotion, which I'll talk about next slide. And then as we sort of bring them together, so to speak, we then you know, go from a red and we go to more of a yellow here where we, now we have a patient who's motivated, who's receptive in that they've spent a fair amount of time with our education team about the modalities. Um, there's also areas where, again, some, some techniques that require you know, goal setting, you do kind of a, a little bit of this evaluation piece, understanding you know, why would they wanna do home dialysis? They wanna go back to work. And then you identify the patient says, yeah, I'm motivated. I'm ready to do home dialysis. Now we really find areas where, you know, not only do we we we, we identify a training center, we try to find a nice fit. The review of being the, the fortune being at UC Davis is that we have multiple different providers we work with. We work with nonprofits, we work with for profits, LDOs, SDOs, MDOs of all facets, and we really have the opportunity to preview um, a wide range of different um, centers with different uh, levels of expertise, if you will, of those patients who are doing PE. So we really try to find, especially in a Spanish speaking or there's a language barrier, we really try to find that quote unquote fit where we could really optimize that training. I think that's something that we've learned over the years. And then we secure training. And the ideal here would be to then go straight to a training program. Um, if the patient's going to do urgent start PD, we may start the patient in the hospital, but then obviously transition them based on our um, clinical judgment over to the outpatient. And then as we go through the training, we sort of think about going back to an extension of that is not just doing home, but it's also you want to ensure these patients will be successful. So we home visits, frequent contact, this is call it the first 90 days. You know, the home new, home new, the uh, honeymoon period could be quite um, a big part of this. So 90 days, we reinforce the training. We do a lot of the um, technique fatigue and identification early. We know that in some Therapy, especially with HHD, home hemodialysis, there's sort of this uh, technique fatigue that sets in after 90 days. So we really want to be um, uh, cognizant of this. So we really follow through with the patients that we get from an unplanned start into a home program. We have follow through and then we could sort of look at kind of their, their outcomes and really learn from each other as a community to say, okay, what, what could we be doing differently? How do we, how should we be thinking about this as we transition these patients? Next slide. And so I think home dialysis is the X factor. Um, a little, uh, a quick story on, on this. I think uh, for the longest time, I 
thought that uh, when I first came to UC Davis, I did my training here, we had a significant amount of input on, okay, patient needs analysis, we're gonna send out to a clinic. And Maureen was one of our um, you know, clinical nurse specialists. She's actually uh, does a great job with our CRRTs and does a lot of the in-service for a lot of our uh, renal replacement therapies in the hospital. But really what kind of struck chord with I think her and her energy was seeing these great stories uh, and thinking about, you know, as we thought about urgent start patients, uh, in, in 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, I, I think it really caught on like an infectious bug, if you will, in a good way. And we all sort of got infected with this bug and saying, wow, these are great stories. Why can't we put, so she came up with this quote, home dials is an X factor. So not thinking about going through the motions and saying, oh, this patient's going to go on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, but how, how can we really elevate this patient, the X, and, and, and how can they can, can they really do the X's, the home dialysis, and then really thinking about the Y piece of it. And I think that the, the only way to get to the Y piece is really understanding, um, you know, the therapy, understanding the, um, you know, the pros and cons. And so I think we really feel the X is the X factor that could be a game changer for many patients to sort of look at something so um, fearful and something that's gonna be so life-changing like end-stage kidney disease, but be able to, to promote it. And it could be done because we've been uh, working at this. Next slide. And so I, I think as we think about how do we think about, because um, we just can't clone um, our staff, right? We, we, you know, like I like always tell Maureen, the, Maureen doesn't grow on these trees. We don't have a farm of Marines where we could just send them out all the, every single hospital in the country. So we need to find uh, sort of these safe havens, if you will, areas now, why, why, why not think about if the patients are going to an in-center unit, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, can we create a unit within the unit that has a lot of these same sort of individualization principles? And so these centers are coming up and you may hear about there's about 30 or so in the country. We actually uh, started one here uh, collaborating with our uh, nonprofit, um, you know, Satellite Healthcare. We did one here in Sacramento and it was, you know, looking at it a little bit differently. The patients who are about to start dialysis are the, the sickest patients. They need the most individualized attention. And so throwing them in a sink is sick model and say, well, we're just going to put you in a, in, a, in a session with everybody who's been on there for three years. And we know those first 90 days could be quite traumatic and, and, and involving a lot of uh, rehospitalization rates. So I think this is what, what we're seeing. Next slide. And just kind of a quick uh, summary of, of what this looks like. It's again, it's a center within the center. We sometimes see these centers also, these CARES in and home program, but most of them are an in-center program. The idea is to optimize your, oftentimes you're providing more than your standard three days a week dialysis. You're doing three, four, five days, up to four weeks. The, the operative word here is engage, educate. You educate all the modalities. So the patients obviously are coming in there with a hemocatheter. Um, most often than not, since they're new starts and we're looking at having to work backwards to get rid of the CVC, get rid of the central venous catheter. The PD option is, is and they're obviously working towards a fish shop, they're gonna stay on hemo. And the patients you certainly could move. We Some folks have used this center also for patients who are transitioning from other modalities. If they were on PD, you know, there's a lot of the patients who are on PD, unfortunately end up also as sort of a double crash and up in the hospital, can those patients come in or if they're switching from a, a transplantation and kind of reconnecting with modality and education. This is a way of really trying to come up with a safety net, but a community answer to it and not really relying on the hospital, which again, a lot of our hospitals are really uh, strapped for resources and, and may not have that infrastructure to really do this robust uh, identification and, 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 um, and promoting. And so if you look at the, and then working together with the home and the insert. So really working a transitional care team is almost like a special team if you want to use a football analogy, it's like your special teams. You have offense, you have defense, and you have that special team that could actually turn patients over. You could take a patient who maybe was in the center or a patient who's about to go to center and then be give them that extra time, that extra runway to consider home dialysis in this four week period of time. And if the patients choose to go in center, at least they've been given that opportunity to really explore and consider a home modality. Next slide. And so I think as we build trust and we empower, I think we our programs also empower. As we empower our patients and we see these fantastic stories, we also empower in the things that we do. But we also empower understand where our areas of improvement and where we can improve and where we can really um, do better. 
and it really is important uh, to, to really in, in, entrust in the team and entrust in patients that, you know, the patients, the, the magic of the human spirit is, is amazing. And I think the more that we could really tap into it and, and allow patients to really discover, I think that we, we would all think we would, we, we would do, we, we could do much better. Next slide. And so this is kind of a, a schematic how we think about a kind of a hospital based team. You have a self, you have a family and then that trust is kind of what, 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 what bridges the gap and, and kind of brings everyone together. Next slide. Um, so really the, 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 the message here about how do we uh, thrive, I, I really try to uh, send a positive message. So we want to listen, we want to empathize. I call it good old fashioned doctoring. Um, you want to avoid the disabled label. I think this always sort of irks me when we have, you know, some of our young patients who are um, driving to the clinic, but then they're, you know, um, because they just don't feel well. And so we want to sort of uh, really have an image change and say, look, you're on dialysis to feel better. And if you're not feeling better, then how do we make you feel better, if you will? And then we want to, you know, as a as the great Jackie Robinson said, life isn't a, isn't a spectator sport, right? Life isn't a spectator sport. It requires active participation. So we really want to force participation. We want to change the culture of end stage. Unfortunately, um, fortunately, you know, end stage skin disease is a term that's used by CMS, but I think for the longest time we've tried to avoid the word end stage and try to use it more for CKD um, because I, I, unlike liver disease, I think we do have an opportunity to, to live. Um, we have dialysis, liver disease, doesn't have any options. It's transplantation or unfortunately hospice care. Next slide. So we really want to sort of emphasize this. Um, and so again, going to have an overview of mindfulness and empathy. This is uh, era, this is an area that I think requires, um, I think just a lot of experience and know how I know this is sort of a, a term that's been used a lot in many facets of our own lives, especially with this pandemic that we do in order for us to be sort of resilient in, in the work that we do. But it's sort of being curious, being non-gentle, non-judgmental, listening, making eye contact. I always say like you got to be able to see the patient. You know, we have busy lives or rounding, uh, especially for our in-center patients, and many patients may be sleeping. It, it's an important area here to really have that contact. And so, how do we um, how do we feel in your body? And I think this is an area where Maureen does her magic, if you will, not to say she. She really spends time and, and does some of these techniques, uh, you know, these slow, deep breathing. She may engage patients to do some of that as she it's, she senses fear. We could sense fear, we, you know, we're human. So we could sense when someone is closed down or, or not open for discussion and, and it's fear oftentimes. So you want to sort of slow the process down and not rush it. And so this is where you may need a little bit more time for some patients than just sort of the, you know, three to four days that they're in the hospital. Next slide. So I think that uh, summarizing, I, I, I would say that it, it's an opportunity now in the 2021 and hopefully as we get on the side of this pandemic, um, you know, I really think it's surprisingly with this pandemic, as you may know, national data suggests there's been an uptick of home dialysis and uh, in, in probably for obvious reasons, uh, given some of the uh, benefits of, of being able to be kind of in your home versus being in a, in a center and reducing perhaps the mitigating some of those uh, risk factors for um, the pandemic, for the, um, uh, you know, for, for COVID. And so certainly as the vaccine is rolled out and as we really get, you know, we reframe the conversation with how are we going to really meet these executive order uh, mandates? And, and I think programs like this, this is just one example of how we've been doing at UC Davis for over 10 years. And it will give you a little bit of a tidbit of how maybe some of the same concepts can be sort of looked at many different strategies um, to really we'll really get to really case management and navigation really be able to get patients um, into um, the right appropriate program at the right appropriate time so this has to be a continuous process it shouldn't be a one-stop shop um, and i think that as i say it's like we shouldn't just have a entry into a freeway we should always have exits um, i think if you get on the on ramp we should be able to exit and those exits, I think it's a behooves of the clinical team, both on the hospital side and also on the clinic side, outpatient side, who have the most contact with our patients at least 12 times a month to really have these conversations. And so I'll go ahead and uh, take the first question. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you Dr. Everybody. Morphin. Yeah. Um, a lot of good um, information. Thank you for sharing all the wonderful work you're doing. 
there in the home program and with your optimal transmission transition programs. Uh, we do have some questions that came in, so I'll go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, first question here is, uh, where would I find links to articles um, for, oops, yep, to um, a focus on prescribing home dialysis for those nephrologists less comfortable with home dialysis? Yeah, so um, we could actually, so there is a, a few resources out there um, that are out there. I know that there is um, Home Dialysis University. They, they put on uh, webinars, um, and I th so we could certainly link that way. I think there's also, obviously, um, there's a recent handbook that has come out. It's a handbook for home hemodialysis. There's also a handbook for the peritoneal dialysis uh, by Steve Guest for the peritoneal dialysis. That one's about six, seven years old, but I think very pragmatic um, in terms of uh, textbooks on it. And But I would say that, um, you know, they're, they're, those are in, and I, I know I could speak for myself. I've done a few seminars um, with different providers, you know, where, like I said, I work across the board um, and, and we do a lot on prescribing. Um, and I think that uh, I certainly could share with some references uh, on uh, maybe some references both in the literature and then maybe some um, handbooks and then maybe some uh, webinars that would be helpful for but I, I I would definitely agree that as the old saying goes it it, the, it seems like the nurses do more prescribing than the doctors not to say that that's um, all that bad but I think the doctors need to have a some comfort level um, with um, especially when the prescription has to change and then having and, and the more experience that we have with patients, I think that they're that the, the better that they become more comfortable with it. But I know that's a big area that we need to improve on. And we're working um, more upstream and working with our fellowship training programs. And actually, I'll say one comment on that. We've had uh, surveys from the ASN with exiting fellows and the two, uh, the one and two items that they want to see more of is PD and home hemodialysis prescribing. So uh, we know, sadly, I think there's many centers that don't have enough of um, home um, uh, exposure in their training program. So then it becomes, you know, how do you expect them to prescribe in the real world? So I, I could get that forward to you. Thank you. Steph. Okay, great. Great. Alan, uh, another question for you. Uh, do you find insurance hindrances to the uptake of home therapies? We have a fair amount of uninsured initial starts and in North Carolina, the Medicaid and emergency Medicaid for undocumented patients are not eligible for home therapy insurance coverage. Wow, that is um, that is an interesting and a hot button issue. I know that uh, I recently, I think there was a recent some some studies I've looked at, and it sounds like it, there's in center, and I think everything happens in phases. Um, I, I do feel um, there's been more uh, policy set forth um, in some of. The states, as you may know, um, do not even provide outpatient and center dialysis, and they um, use the word I use the word compassion dialysis. So the patients go to the ER, and there's been a lot of uh, evaluation of that of those practices, where perhaps and they're leading to more hospitalizations and more utilization of services, paradoxically than you would think. But then just putting the patient in the center three times a week. So I think that 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 that, that would be an interesting conversation to have in your state about really being able to see, well, if you're able to, to show that, oh, well, the patients who are doing home dialysis tend to maybe go to the hospital less, um, you know, again, we haven't had that problem in California because I think we do cover home dialysis even for patients who have emergency Medicaid who are undocumented, like you stated. Um, we could provide dialysis outpatients, but I do understand the, um, the you know, politics is local, as they say, so I would say that um, the challenge there would be then to, to, to take a, a page out of providing outpatient in center dialysis. Why would a home therapy, perhaps we know that with peritoneal dialysis, the utilization of services, I mean, are 60 cents to the dollar. I mean, you could you could save 30, 40 uh, percent on your on your uh, resources just by using peritoneal. Um, and home hemo is probably in between that. And a lot of it is real is reduced utilizations of uh, hospitalizations. So I think that there probably is someone needs to probably have a, a study or, or or some commentary uh, on the um, you know the the, the benefits um, from a you know because dollars talk when it comes to policy 
to have those kind of conversations uh, about really uh, providing services and access to, to this very, very uh, vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I've got another question here. It says, uh, asks, at what point in renal decline would you introduce extensive education regarding home, home modalities? Uh, for example, if following a patient CKD stage two to three, when would you advise starting the conversation to prep for PD instead of waiting for the event to push the patient into emergent HD? Yeah, so I think the, you know, when we, when we looked at our studies, the patients who went to education, the patients who actually, um, the ones that were quote unquote more predictable, I think those are to, in many ways more predictable in that you have perhaps good follow-up and you're getting, um, you know, you, you have a patient who is predictably on the steady decline and they're losing maybe three to 4% mLs per minute. Obviously you're doing everything in your effort to reduce that, that rate and make it maybe closer to one if you can and using some of these uh, you know, RAS inhibitors, SGLT2, there's a lot right now in, in the kidney world that is using a preserve for kidney preservation. But I would say that we're, we're, we're really trying to look at patients, really identifying them at risk. Clearly that patient who has, you know, a significant amount of albuminuria, who's a diabetic that you sort of could predict them, clearly that patient needs to be educated when their GFR is, you know, and most of us think even if their GFR is less than 60, their stage three or stage three B less than 45, they need to at least have an in-service and maybe the conversations could continue. And I, my point again is you don't just go once, it's it, it because patients forget, you know, I, I went to education three years ago and all of a sudden now my GFR is 15. They should reconnect with um, our educator, your education team. And then as you start having more concrete conversations about the next stage, about their next process and one of them moving forward to peritoneal, for example, in this case, and how that's gonna look like, whether it's gonna be a buried PD catheter or are we gonna, are we gonna have you know, timely access, on-demand access, means if I call my surgeon because the GFR is eight, he's having a little bit of nausea and I could preemptively start, I could get a PD catheter in a day or two, great. So it's all about understanding your resources. Some centers you know, have may not have that level of access to PD and they may benefit from maybe in a, a very PD catheter. Um, there are some patients really, so really what that, what's buried in that question then is who are the progressors and who are not the progressors? And I guess my point earlier is that we have patients who are non-progressors. You know, they're 75 years old, so you have CKD stage four, um, they have no albuminuria, they have good blood pressure control, they have heart disease, they have peripheral arterial disease, their GFR has been stuck, you know, at, um, you know, 25 to 30 for like seven years. They haven't progressed, but the only thing that's changed is seven years. And all of a sudden they get their MI or they get a COVID. Boom. That's that patient that, that I was talking about, sort of a sudden start. And that patient, yeah, I think you could have an education of what if. And maybe that's maybe what we need to do is extend the tent on those patients. And but it's not clear to me that that patient will progress to end stage kidney disease when they've been at 25 percent for seven years. For that example, so it requires a little bit of nuance. Now, if you want to send all patients with GFR less than 45 for education, I don't think that's going to be a problem with that as long as you're able to accommodate that education. Um, and maybe uh, you know maybe it lights a spark in a patient who you know, is, is, is probably less than likely to need dialysis, but maybe could use a little bit better adherence with some of their medications and that the fear of dialysis may be enough for them to. So I think that would probably be, if you're, if you're strategizing or limiting on, on, on who the higher risk patients, then I would probably employ the priority list of these are the patients as you get closer and having, I think what we're seeing in population management in our health systems is now we're actually having um, more oversight because we're using a lot of IT technology. So these patients are flagging up on our medical record and we're actually employing a uh, case management and, and really uh, allowing a more support for that sort of quote unquote lone nephrologist that can't do all of this. So I think this is getting to a sort of a higher level where we're having a system level where you can really um, identify these patients rather than that sort of um, one patient at a time approach, which I think oftentimes I think we miss many of them. All right, thank you. Uh, another question. Some providers don't want to consider PD for any other patients. They usually aren't keen on HHD either. What is your recommendation for getting those patients to home therapy? 
Yeah, so I think it's and that's an off that's an overt bias. I mean, <laughs> or it could be an implicit bias. Um, like I said, I think oftentimes I'd, I'd be interested in, to hear why. Um, I think it could be, and and, and I hope it's not a, a business decision. I hope that that's not the major reason why that is, um, and there's no conflict. But that aside. I, I think there's an opportunity there as being an advocate. Um, if you are a, a home proponent or, or or you feel like you want to, um, you know, with the mandate, I mean, it's, some of this is just going to have to happen. I mean, there's going to be significant, you know, as these demonstration projects get rolled out and, and, and CMS gets more data from the ongoing uh, models now being looked at, you'll be, um, you know, the virologists are going to have um they're they're going to get the stick unfortunately and i think because they're on the being penalties as you know how this works they wave the carrot and then you get the stick so i think um policy dictates practice so i think it would what my argument to them would be you may not like it i like to hear why but let's talk about how we can do home it may not be for everybody but clearly i think that i think that then maybe we could amass some of the biases and concerns but i tell you if it's from a business perspective and policies are changing and there's going to be significant penalties, I think they think it, 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 it'll be interesting to see how quickly they change your tone. Well, I think one, one more quick question, if we can, and then uh, we're sure. getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, are you utilizing any form of telemedicine uh, for your patients that live, your home patients that live out in the rural areas? Yeah, I um, and as we all have had to live in this pandemic, we've, we've become more comfortable out of necessity to use it even in our urban centers, using it in our uh, nursing homes, telemedicine, even in our hospitals. We were using telemedicine there for a while for some of our COVID patients um, who were um, in COVID units that were using, um, you know, there's no need to go and start examining the limit exposure, limit, limit transmission. So I think that we are... Um, Right now, I, I think that we're still kind of in the pandemic, and before the pandemic, there was already um, there was language uh, built in CMS in terms of originating sites. Um, there were rural areas, so falling under those conditions, I think there uh, there has been really good practices uh, of uh, centers that are using telemedicine. I would say even for our urban centers in Sacramento, we are able to do telemedicine two out of every three. Um, you know, we have in person. I think it has to be after 90 days, I believe, after their training. I think if the training has to be in face-to-face, -face, but I think after that 30, 90-day period, you could do telemedicine um, two out of every three months, I believe. And I think you could do, uh, and, and so I think that, that we have been using that even for our patients have adopted it. And surprisingly, even our baby movers have have, been, have grasped onto it. I think, uh, so I think it's here to stay. I think telemedicine is here to stay. And then to one other point with that is a lot of the technology and the devices that are coming onto the market are using a lot of Bluetooth technology, um, the PD cyclers, the home hemo cyclers. So you're getting a lot of like fingertip data. And the longest time, I think I always use the expression, I think just because they're home doesn't mean you don't trust them. You trust them, but you want to verify, right? So trust, but verify. So having this technology, the connectivity piece to know, you know, how the treatments are going, it, at your fingertips, I think it is going to also enhance the therapy in terms of with our patients. And, and I think that that's so th there's going to be a lot of that technology that is going to be here to stay. And I think those are if there's a silver lining of all this. I think that would be it. Yeah, uh, agreed. I think it's here to stay. So, sure. well, th th thank you, Dr. Morphin, again for that wonderful presentation. Um, Matt, I think we'll go to the next slide and we'll wrap up. I do want to remind everybody again, in case you missed the announcement at the beginning, this event is approved for one CEU. Please uh, stay connected after we end the, this event and you will be taken to a post survey, uh, giving you the opportunity to share your feedback. After submitting that button, you'll be taken to our Learning Management Center where there you'll be able to obtain your CEU for today's event. Uh, again, I really want to uh, say thank you to Dr. Morphin taking time out of your busy day. Thank you everybody for joining us today for this um, presentation. We really appreciate it. I hope it's helped everybody. It certainly uh, gave me a lot of new information and I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the great talk, says Rebecca in through the chat. I, I agree. Thank you everybody. Have a good rest of your day and take care. <laughs>